curious if there's anyone who heard something from their partner that excited them or maybe was like really resonated with them um, that they would like to share with us. So what I'm asking you to do is to introduce your partner and why they're here. Um, but we only have time for just a few people to do that. Is there anyone who felt like, yes, when they heard why their partner is here? Okay, I got a few hands. All right, I'll start over here. And please share your name as well. Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Adam. I'm just here to uh, introduce Andrew to you all. He's visiting from Dallas, and he's doing something very similar, or trying to start something very similar in his area to what the Bay Docks uh, system is here. So I think that's really worth uh, rec recognizing. Chelsea Restrum, and I'd like to introduce you to Carissa, who's here to create software uh, for networks of cooperatives. Yeah? Awesome. Hey, welcome you both. I saw one other hand here. Yes. I'm going to come past you here. If you could stand sure. and share your name as well. My name is Ryan, and this is Barack, and he's interested in creating a high school course that uh, deals with new economy or uh, new economy kind of uh, ideas. Yay. Uh, <laughs> Anyone else? You can take one more. Oh, you were the first one. Closest. <laughs> Hi, um, how are you? Just Catherine. We have a wonderful conversation about Hawaii. She knows where she comes from, and how the culture there is so much about sharing and giving. And constantly, she's telling me about how she hasn't bought clothes in years, and every meal is you know, come from friends and giving to each other. And um, I love Hawaii too. I go there a lot, and that's exactly the same experience I have. And I just love that kind of culture. I'm so glad there's some of that left still in this country. Yeah. <laughs> Beautiful. Thank you. Welcome. So, <clears throat> we're, we're really going to jump right into it. Um, we've all come here to discuss the roots of this new economy, and I've had the pleasure to chat ahead of time with the panelists here, and what they have to, to offer to this conversation is so brilliant, really, and coming from very, very different perspectives and life experiences. So I'm wanting to get the microphones to them um, as soon as possible, and maybe we can start off just with an introduction so we can all share a little bit about who we are um, and why we're here. And uh, I'll start. So again, my name is Barbara Jefferson. I'm from Seattle, Washington. Anyone been up to Seattle or, yeah, all right. You can make some noise for that. Yes. Um, and I'm here with my partner, Sanj Basha, who also came, we moved here from Seattle a couple of years ago. For the last couple of years, I've been working mostly on leadership development with young adults, helping our generation confront the reality of the issues that we're facing socially, environmentally, economically, and to see our role as solutionaries within it. Um, and so I'm excited to be here because what we're doing today is really talking about, you know, the roots of those solutions um, and, and how we can really honor, uh, acknowledge, and integrate those roots. So thank you for having me. I also want to give a shout out to a new project that Sanj and I have started called Brave Space, where we're looking to focus our leadership, our passion for community development and for solutions on marginalized communities, particularly queer people of color. So I'm here repping those communities today and glad to be here. Hi everyone, how are you doing this morning? Great. Yeah, so far so good. Really good interesting conversations leading up to this moment. My name is Yvette Holt. because of that with Sandy Charles as we were introducing or reintroducing ourselves. I just have this kind of undying fire that says there's got to be another way. And so I'm always finding myself in the place where it feels like I can uh, 
affect some of that change, even just more, you know, in a small amount. Um, but by means of reintroducing skills and tools that folks have um, already internally, inherently, by virtue of just being alive, breathing, here, and a sentient being, those come to the surface when we do share bartering projects and things where we are building community as well as resources. So I'm about doing a different kind of business and making a different kind of profit. Mm -hmm. um, hi, I'm Charles Eisenstein. Most of you um, already got a bit of me in the morning. Um, I'm a speaker, storyteller, writer, and um, my intention for this panel is just to really be in service to whatever wants to emerge. Hi, my name is Drew Dellinger, and uh, I'm excited to be part of this panel and uh, participate and learn a lot. Economics is not like my forte uh, by any means, but I've been very interested in looking at the worldview um, that's underlying the modern system and uh, looking at how we can build a movement that connects ecology and social justice and also looks at cosmology, looks at the worldview, looks at the stories and the narratives that are um, driving the modern capitalist system that are behind some of the social injustices and the ecological destruction. So I'm really interested in those connecting links between ecology, justice, and worldview. And, uh, just happy to uh, listen and participate and contribute however I can. Hello, my name is Paloma. I am the founder of Sapichai. Sapichai in Quechua means my roots. We are an indigenous rights and ancestral reconnection organization. Essentially, it's focused on cultural survival. And for us, cultural survival is survival in general. Um, and of course, um, I guess economics works into all of that because part of our way of functioning was through a lot of um, Aini, a lot of exchange, um, Minka, exchange of work and labor sharing. Uh, much of this has been affected by the new economy, which for us is the capitalistic economy. Um, so I'll be giving that perspective a little bit more. You all ready to get started? Yeah. 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 Wonderful. So to begin, I wanted to read um, an excerpt from an article that I read this past week. So it was New Economy Week, uh, October 13th, the week of October 13th, uh, and it was hosted by the New Economy Coalition, um, which is a coalition of many organizations across the country who have been working to create more equitable systems and models within their communities. Um, many low-income um, communities of color and um, you know, communities at the front lines of a lot of the issues that we're facing. Um, and I was struck by this article called There's Nothing New About the New Economy. And it, uh, I found that it really related to what we're here to talk about today. So first I'm going to just read a little clip from it and then open it up to the panel for their uh, thoughts or reflections on it. This was written by, and excuse me for mispronouncing your name, Kwabena Nkrumo. The term New World originated in the early 16th century after Europeans made landfall in what would later be called the Americas. Of course, the land known as the Americas was only new to Europeans, as other people had known this place well before Columbus. This short history, little snippet, can serve to keep us to be wary of when certain folks name something new. From the perspective of a Eurocentric worldview and assumptions of white supremacy, anything that white people have not experienced before is new. <laughs> no matter who else may have been involved with it before them. And this is how I feel about the term new economy. Even though I recognize certain innovations that are involved with work in our contemporary movement, I resent the implied dismissal of the alternative economic strategies utilized over the years by people of color to survive the abuses of racialized Western capitalism. Many of the foundational tenets of the new economy 
are in my mind actually native to the traditions of my folks and others. <laughs>
I believe that those who are accustomed to more treating, especially when I'm referring to our communities that are rural communities, you don't so much need to focus on, on them, on us, because that's inherent. And once that starts to be revalued and it comes back, it's the way things have always functioned. And so things just go right back to how they were. People will be able to go back into exchanging labor, into goods. Um, the, the people who are gonna have more difficulty are gonna be those that are in urban areas because they don't have that land, that space to be able to produce the food, to dye the clothes, to be able to take raw material and turn it into something. Um, so I think it would be particularly interesting to hear from the urban perspective on how one sees the possibility of going into that trading economy because eventually in urban areas, uh, people are so used to being dependent on um, things that cost money because you're, you're focusing on corporations that are around you, you have electricity, but there's so many things that you can't, it's difficult to escape here in, in an urban setting, whereas in a rural setting, it's completely, completely different. Um, so if we didn't have the position of having to use money um, placed onto us and having those values flipped and being forced to adapt to a economic system that we are already so behind in. Um, yeah, we wouldn't we wouldn't be suffering at all. We'd be quite fine.
what would that be like? How would I, how would I get the things done that I need to get done? What kind of changes would I have to make in my life right now, today, to live that experience? And do I do it and like, oh, I'm not going to tell anybody and try and make it look like I'm still holding it together? <laughs> or do I make it clear that I'm doing this as an experiment in my life and I'm making the <coughs> sacrifices and dealing with the repercussions of that change? I have two teenage boys. They have to join in that with me. My 12-year-old now takes his bike to the bus, puts his own bike on the bus rack in the front, rides the 15 blocks, gets off, takes his bike off, rides to his dance studio so he can go to dance rehearsals, and then we get a carpool ride home. It's an experiment. We may not last forever, but it's those kind of choices that I think that really are going to make the difference because it's not just like, if you're on a diet and you say, oh, I can't eat um, sugar or cookies or whatever for a, a week and I'm going to lose 10 pounds. And then you make a big effort to do that, and at the end of the week you lose 10, 10 pounds, and then you go back to your old habits, it's just not effective or sustainable. So if you make it part of your walk, your daily journey, then you might get different. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, I'm thinking of that, of that Pueblo and um, no one having credit. And it occurs to me that credit is really a replacement for community. Because in community, everybody kind of owes each other because everybody's helped each other out. And if you are an economic developer and you see a community like that, you think, ah, here's an untapped market, an undeveloped market. <laughs> and we could replace all of these linkages. You know, go to Peru and find a village where people still help each other and replace all of these social functions and skills with something you have to pay for. And that, and then GDP goes up, and there's a new source for bank lending, and the system works for a little bit longer. So I think, yeah, I mean, I think pretty much everybody here would agree that um, our fetish for newness is part of the problem. Our disconnect from history, uh, not only um, communities of color, but but you know even white people. I mean, if I speak in like you know. Vermont or somewhere like that, uh, or you know maybe a rancher will come to a talk or something, and he's like, yeah, you know, we used to have that. We used to take care of each other. So this has happened everywhere. What's new, I guess, is to um, bring this kind of um, mutual care uh, and community back into the context that we're in, we, meaning the dominant culture, are in today. Like, that would be new. We don't really know how to do that. And our, because the system that we have today is so obviously not working, we're, we, we're, we're losing some of our arrogance that was behind the ideology of development that said, you know, obviously our ways are better. And we're going to bring the, the wondrous fruits of technology and, and development uh, and free markets to the rest of the world so that they can enjoy the paradise that we are getting closer and closer to, right? Like, it's going to come soon, right? We're going to live in this technological paradise soon. It's almost here, and we've been living in, in that since I was a kid. You know, when I was a kid, 1990 was this impossibly futuristic year, and so it's never happened. And instead, things are falling apart, and ecological basis of life is deteriorating and and you know everything's getting worse and we're losing our arrogance uh, and no longer thinking well development must be good because it'll make you more like us we're losing that arrogance maybe you can't detect it yet but it's starting I think a lot of the hunger for indigenous knowledge it's not just the next kind of cultural appropriation where we're going to steal something else from you, we're going to steal your songs, we're going to steal your rituals and turn those into a product. It's not just that. There's also, uh, I think, a humility that's born of the humiliation of the failure of our system. Uh, and so I think that, I hope I'm not being overly optimistic, um, but I, I think that we, and when I say we, I mean the people that I grew up with, the dominant culture, I think that we are approaching the point of being 
willing to learn from the old. And the habits are strong. The habits that I grew up that, that of my culture are strong. Reminded, I was in South Africa recently. And so now we're going to have the green economy. So there was this program where, where solar panels, solar electrical systems were distributed throughout the township uh, somewhere in South Africa. And every family got one. And this was a very popular program because everybody took their solar units and sold them on the black market. <laughs> <laughs> and so this mindset of we're gonna come and we're gonna come and help you. We're reaching the point where we don't even know how to help and maybe we're ready to learn. reforms 
that are acceptable to the system. It's usually the kinds that make those communities more vulnerable to the predations of global capital. So in the era since desegregation, uh, black literacy has declined. Uh, black ownership of businesses has declined. It's like, yes, now you have an equal right to become a consumer uh, and a alienated producer. You know, so, so I don't know, just a, a, a little something I like to, to think about, just tweak my brain. Reconnecting with your roots, like as you were saying, is fundamental in all of this. Um, the reason we're called Sapichai, my roots, is because we believe in that. We believe that through being connected to your roots, through being connected to traditional practices, you're able to value who we are, what what we've been about, our history, our practices, and it's because the lost we've lost so much of it we are in the situation that we're in. Um, there's a program in Peru where in rural, certain rural communities have a certain amount of money that they get each month. Um, what, what that's done is it's made it so people are not dependent on one another anymore. And so you're noticing people once becoming isolated again, um, like up here, and you lose that sense of community. Everyone that I speak to complains about not having Minka or Aini anymore, this exchange. Um, there's a lot of distrust now because there's not that sense of community. People aren't coming together anymore. There isn't, traditionally, people would help build one another's homes when somebody would get married. Everyone in the community would come and build that home. And then when the next person got married, everybody would go and build that person's home. And yeah, now that people can just receive money, that doesn't happen. That loss of community is really evident. Um, so part of what we do is helping people reconnect to these practices and not just refine themselves, but also their community. And once, when you do see that happen, it's amazing because people start to understand how that separation is actually bad for them, how separating from the community is actually affecting them negatively. Um, especially with farming practices. That's that's one of the places where it's really evident because how much um, agrochemicals are imposed onto us. Um, because the whole idea, produce more, you, ma you make more money, you'll have, you'll have much more than everybody else, and so on and so forth. You can be apart from the community. Um, so yeah, it's this, this idea of being separate from the community is what is being pushed very, very strongly onto us. And the more we can see through that and reject that and stay as a whole, as one community, the, the, the better chance we have to be able to survive and thrive. Just what, what you said, Paloma, about the, this idea of being separate from the community is being pushed upon uh, the folks down there. And, and that's really a summarizes so much of the Western worldview, is that uh, this idea of being separated from the community. I mean, Thomas Berry's critique of Western culture is anthropocentrism, human centeredness. It's based on this uh, supposition of separation. It's based on a worldview of the parts mentality, fragmentation, alienation, separation, that isn't in line with reality. And Berry said you can feel alienated, but you can never actually be alienated. And so I think the roots of what we're moving toward as we transform uh, the modern Western capitalist consumer economy is moving toward a worldview and understanding of connection, of interdependence, of mutuality. And when we look at part of why it's useful to look at this larger level of worldview is because that connects the issues. Once you look at the worldview, you're looking at ecology connected to cosmology, connected to social justice, connected to economics. And you know, so Martin Luther King said it really boils down to this: that all life is interrelated. You know, he's a social justice, human rights, um, civil rights thinker. He's very interested in how do we transform the economy at the end of, the, of his life, particularly. And yet, he's making these ecological, cosmological, systems thinking statements like it really boils down to this: that all life is interrelated. 
So I think what you know, back to the roots of the, the new economy or the transformation that we're uh, moving toward, it's going to be a much more indigenous, much more ancient, um, much more original kind of understanding of participation. You know, participation, call response in music or in preaching is the living embodiment of participation. So there are rituals, there are musical art forms that uh, connect us, you know, to these experiences of communion. And I think that's really what we're, we're seeking. You know, we've been sold this idea that what we want is experiences of capitalism, experiences of consumption. But I think what really makes us happy is experiences of creativity, experiences of community, and experiences of community. So I think those are some of the ancient and more indigenous roots. And like the romantic tradition would be a way that that was kept alive uh, within the Western tradition, very much a rejection of the rationalism and the economic definition of what it means to be human and this sort of thing. Yeah, what I really heard you speaking to in that is like the the spirit of the these alternative economies. Like what's what's really at the foundation of them? And and I heard everyone really speak the word community um, and and participation. That there everybody owes everybody because because we're all in this together. And we're all helping one another out. So I want to transition and and ask for your participation. Um, opening up for maybe about 10 minutes to see if there are any questions or comments that you have um, out here. And I see a couple of hands, but before I start passing the mic out, I want to just say we only got 10 minutes. Um, so if there's a specific panelist that you want to ask the question to, please do, and then that way we can make sure you, your needs are met in that way. And take a second to just see if you can Simmer your question down to something concise. That way we can get to as many people as possible. And same thing here. So we'll see, try to simmer our answers down to something um, we can speak with brevity. All right. Do I see a hand? I'll start right here. Um, so I really resonate with a lot of what y'all are saying, and I'm still feeling like um, there's sort of this romanticized idea of, of revisiting the roots in a way that doesn't seem very practical for people who are actually like running the show um, of this economy. So my question might speak to you, Charles, because I was really curious about what you said as far as does does feeding communities, um, disen disenfranchised or marginalized communities into this larger system, would that, is that going to actually benefit them? Um, and that got me turning and my question is, if not, then what? Then how do we create equity without just feeding people who have less resources into the larger system. Um, do we just leave them on their own to, to get back to these roots and to create their own, or is there a way that we can actually tangibly participate in creating those those resources and that access? Thank you. I'll be brief. Yeah. Depends what we mean by we, but if you're talking about the people who have power in the current system, um, and what do you do when you don't know how to help, and you don't know what they need, and you begin to sense that they know better than you do, well, at least what you can do is to stop taking, uh, which means debt cancellation. Mm. Many other things, but let's start there. <laughs> Hi, my name is Andreas. Um, <clears throat> I really resonate with what we're talking about here in terms of that idea of community really being connected to each other, the barn raising, people come together to build a house for each other. It seems to me that that was sort of the way it worked when you had much smaller communities working together where people had emotional connection to each other, you know, a tribe of, you know, whatever, 100 people or whatever it was. Yeah. Now that we have millions of people in densely populated areas, urban areas, there's so many people on the street, it's hard to have that emotional connection with everyone. How do you guys see this sort of playing out with, with densely populated areas? That's the new part. <laughs> um, I think it, it does. Oops, sorry. It does actually come to making those personal sacrifices that um, I was talking about <coughs> earlier. Because the more that you do that, the more you'll find yourself in the company and in the um, in the flow, if you will, um, with other folks doing that. And so that is kind of a natural coalescence. 
and there'll be vehicles and uh, utilities to facilitate that. We'll be looking for those, and that's part of, like Cheryl said, the new. So. Thank you. Well, I'd, be, I'd be interested to see, like, as a rural person, looking at all of this, what would, if you, like, if we came to you and said, what do we really have to know that we're not seeing? What would that be? Um, Ten minutes. It's, <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it, yeah, it's, it's so interesting to me because we're so, in Peru, it's such a different context we have. We're so close to where we all came from, whether, so, of course, many people are born in Lima, but their parents or their grandparents still have roots in a particular area, so it's, and, and therefore land. And so it's much easier for me to think, okay, we'll just go home. But here it's very different. That's why my, I posed my question, well, in, in an urban area, how do you do this? Because my context is very different. Um, yeah, and, and I just watch what's happening here. And it, yeah, the issue is the separation. If people were able to, like, I understand that people don't like the idea of being dependent on one another um, because it's inconvenient um, and therefore this is why everybody adopts this idea of purchasing everything and, and living in, in a one family home and things like this and not and, and putting your parents in a home apart from you I still don't understand but um, yeah I think that's that for me that's my observation is why why do you want to live apart from everybody why do you want to put your parents in a home yeah. So this is that's why that's my question is why would you want to do that? And I think each person's response is going to be a little different. And I think it's that's what people need to do is ask themselves this why? Mm. Why is that? Why is that an inconvenience when you first think oh because it's inconvenient? Why? Why do you feel it's inconvenient? Mm -hmm. Thank you. you gonna answer too? Just real quick, we just I was just so struck by when when your vet said that's individualism. It's and I think it's it's so important to remember that a ism, any type of ism is like an ideology or a system. You know, like individuality, you know, and being individuals in some sense, that's okay. But when you make a whole system out of individualism, you see, we've taken it to this hyper extreme. And because it's a whole system, we're, we're entrenched in it. It's not going to be able to, we can't snap our fingers and make a change every night. It's going to be these incremental changes. It's going to be movement building. It's going to be creativity and imagination it's going to be our best thinking you know uh, working day after day week after week to you know to move to a, a transition in which this is possible well, thank you you have your hand here sure i'm ben and um certainly a certain tone has been struck in the conversation around a, a certain um retreat from or moving beyond the uh, the separatist expansionist death-driven um, culture that we're, that we're looking at, and a return to or a recreation of a more connected, ecological, um, uh, collective-oriented or focused culture. And my question is, well, the, the there's an aspect to the expansionism, the, the frontierism, sort of the, the achievements of the individual, which is um, not, perhaps not necessarily entirely dark. Um, my question is, is it possible to have a cultural evolution that both simultaneously deepens our connection to ecosystem, ecologically, and interpersonally, and also has the capacity to support and encourage astounding individual achievements, collective achievements, um, of the, the caliber of putting people in orbit and creating the internet and you know, putting on uh, symphonies and, and so forth. Is, can we do both at the same time? And what would that look like? be 
you know, a realization that some of those things that you believed brought you pleasure or brought a certain sense of individual um, achievement become less important when other things uh, emerge for you. Just leaving that little thought. <laughs> Anyone else want to respond to that? I would just say yes. Uh, I mean, that's what I kind of wrote sacred economics about, you know, how could uh, a mass economy work um, without destroying the basis of life on Earth. Um, most, I mean, the solutions are all out there already. I think I said this other night, you know, it's not the 70s when we didn't know the problems. It's not the 90s when we didn't know the solutions yet. Um, we wouldn't actually have to sacrifice very much that is of any value to have a completely sustainable system, I think. But there's a caveat. That is of any value. That's right. Mm -hmm. We have to sacrifice a lot of what's familiar, but not a lot of what really makes people happy. So you're saying the problem is mainly political then? Just saying, okay, we have to kind of reallocate accordingly? The problem is our deep narratives upon which our political system is based. I have just one mic, and I'm going to pass it to our last person with a question here, please share. Uh, hi, my name is Claudia. I'm here mainly volunteering, but I'm representing actually CASPA, which stands for California Travel Association, and these are the group of people who are architects and uh, building contractors and uh, building engineers who are building um, travel houses, but they're building travel houses for people in really green homes that have a million dollars that can pay the house right away. Um, and I, um, I, mainly, I do bookkeeping and accounting for one of the architects, but I've gotten some questions from people trying to finance a home and regular banks won't talk to them. Um, obviously, because it's not a, a um, um, you know, conventional construction. Um, so some people have the land, I, actually, I have a couple of friends. So I, I wanted to add something to um, what Paloma was saying, and what the reason I came here too was from one of the talks from Mr. the economist, Mr. Valentelli, sitting over there, um, and I asked him this, who would finance people who are trying to build their home, um, because banks would not lend for this uh, uh, kind of building. And so this is why I attended the event, I wanted to get the networking and get the CASMA name out there, although they None of the CASMA members really thought it was, it was um, pretty related, but I think it is because housing is really, um, you know, it's what drives a lot of the, I mean, people here pay a lot of money for housing, people get 30-year loans for homes, and they are supporting the banks who are doing this, you know, driving this economy. So I think I wanted to mention also that we do talk about roots, which is really great. I'm actually Mexican-Lebanese. I lived in Mexico. I was born there. I grew up in a... Adobe home, which is a different, I used to eat the soil out of the walls, because <laughs> it was like, you know, such a good organic thing, just because it smells so good, but <laughs> it was not a healthy thing, I developed stomach worms and all that, that was what I was saying, <laughs> um, anyway, you know, it was a healthy environment, I never got sick, as a matter of fact, um, apparently I got really good bacteria out of that, and I'm very healthy, I don't know, that's what my doctor said, so <laughs> when I asked her, I was really worried about that, um, anyway, I'm kidding, um, I think um, a lot of people feel that they don't have roots because I've been here now 20 years, came here when I was nine, and went through school and college and met all this, not just you know white American people, but even people who have migrated here. So connecting people, my question kind of was, you might have been very connected to your roots because from Peru, uh, like African American communities are also sometimes very closed in. I have like one African American friend, and whenever I can, I go to her house and her family, and just try to be more with my more diverse. I have a very diverse group of friends, but it's difficult to. I don't know if I have a question now. <laughs> Sorry. Um, Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. Well, um, how do you connect the people who feel like don't have roots? Um, how do you? I mean, you do, you know. So. A lot of white Americans don't. It's over in Europe and Germany, right? So they're here. Yeah. yeah. So how do we connect? Okay. Yeah. That's a good question. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, so Sapichai has a section.
commission that responds to this because I witness a lot of people from here, Europe, Australia, come with this desire to fill that void with our culture and um, wanted to buy it. <laughs> you pay to go to an ayahuasca ceremony, you pay for, you know, whatever, so many different things. They want to commodify everything. <laughs> and I got very frustrated, <coughs> indignada. I was so, I didn't have words for it. And then I sat in ceremony and I tried to understand what's the best response for this instead of cursing and being angry. Um, and it came to me very quickly and very easily. And it was very silly that it, I went through even just that, the anger for so long. It's that there's that void that needs to be filled and it needs to be filled through people reconnecting with their roots. And so that's how that started for Sepi Chai. It's this whole other section that helps people, particularly from European descendancy, to connect with their traditions. Because everybody has indigenous ancestry somewhere. Some people are much more removed from it. But everybody has traditional practices that someone down the line did. They worked with traditional herbs. They also had built homes made of stone or adobe or whatever it was in their area. So the knowledge is a little more removed for some people, but it exists. So it's just a matter of deciding that you want to reconnect with that and trying to figure out how to do that. And for those who want to, particularly to connect to the Celtic traditions, then we have people on Sapichai who are helping do that. They're helping people bridge that. So it exists, yeah. Thank you. Like, 
it is about what you do in the next five minutes, in the next hour, in the next day, in the next week, in the next month. You can make decisions about what you do in order to facilitate and support the changes that we're talking about now. Um, and it's not all or nothing either. I mean, there could be a hybridization of what you have to do with what you hope you can do more of. So um, I encourage you to get involved and get started right now, today, tomorrow, as soon as you can, and um, and move forward. Just move forward. Thank you. I would just say I would just really encourage us to think big, to think visionary. I mean, uh, you know, when Charles, you're talking about how the, the the arrogance and the legitimacy of the establishment. You know, the shine is off it, and we need to um, feel really liberated by that. The crisis is, is is scary, but it's liberating in the sense that we need to be bold. We need to be visionary. We need to ask these tough questions every day and all at, at all levels of how can we reinvent the human presence on the planet? How can we create work that feels meaningful? How can we restructure our education and our economy to be around the arts, to be around education, to be around permaculture and creating you know, ecosystem uh, revitalization? Um, this, you, we have to really crack out of this spell and this entrancement that um, the, you know that is that the economy is so tied into but the, the, the modern world you know that's the hinge point it seems to me the worldview is the leverage point but it's everything is centered around how do we define education how do we define work how do we define what it means to be a human what do we do with the majority of our waking hours and so I think we need to be big visionary thinkers and that's one of the reasons why I appreciate King is that he was he was saying, you know, uh, let me wrap up, but King said um, in 1966 that we need a radical redefinition of work. And King said in history we thought of work in terms of relationship with land, with machines, with computers. This is the way we think of work. Now our society must come to see that the most noble work is when you are working to fulfill your own nature, to rise to higher levels of fulfillment. You are working when you are serving people and helping them to develop. So in 1966, King wasn't afraid to take, take, take a hard look at the world of work, to look at the capitalist economy. And I think we need to be just as visionary, just as courageous, just as creative and imaginative today. Um, I guess I would like to finish with um, just a reminder, leaving a, a seat of reminder that when you reconnect to that understanding that we're all interconnected with one another, I have to sacrifice changes. Because so much is already being sacrificed that you don't see. So many people are already sacrificing how they live, their resources. So it's not about, I need to sacrifice. Sacrifice is already happening. It's connect to the fact that you are interconnected with everybody. And you're not sacrificing, you're just you're just understanding your connection. You're feeling your connection. And so therefore, taking an extra half hour or hour or whatever it is that you need to do to be able to live in a way that keeps you more interconnected with one another is no longer a sacrifice. And I think that's important because if we see things as sacrifices, there's too much resistance and it becomes too difficult.
Uh, let's be brief. I just wanted to make that connection because it seemed like it would uh, it emerged, and that I think one of the big unspoken longings uh, for many people that come from uh, those primarily European descent, uh, but for other more recent migrants as well, is that loss of of knowing where you came from, uh, and that it's so unarticulated. Uh, the fellow that you're going to see in the film uh, has actually said that it's it's so gone that even the gone is gone. Hmm. All that's left is this this wound. And uh, the film itself is a short film that kind of touches upon what I think I'll expand on when we talk about it. But essentially, it uh, articulates what it looks like to start that reconnection again. What does it look like, and what does it ask of you, and what does it mean to be human now? So that's what the short's about, uh, and that's what we're going to talk about. So please join me.